All right, hello everybody. I want to talk to you today about Lesson 7, Clashes with Native Americans. Uh, this would have been clashes between Europeans and Native Americans. Uh, and what were the causes of these clashes? What were the, in some cases, very dire consequences of these clashes? So, um, I also want to spend a little bit of time going more into some of the documents now and learning how to uh, look at and interpret some of these documents. So, moving along. Um, you're going to have to listen to these lectures. I'm not going to put as much, um, you know, writing up there, up on the, uh, up on the screen. You're going to be able to get the stuff from, from listening to the lectures. The questions are on the self-guided notes. So, um, today what we'll do is we're going to analyze the causes and consequences for conflict between Native Americans and the English colonies between 1600 and 1750. This is a very significant period of time. Um, and this is going to deal with key concept 2.2.1 through uh, 2 in your AP guide. Let's take a look at this document here for a moment. It says, uh, this is a document, when I, when, I take a, when I look at documents, the first thing that I really want to do is I want to look at the source. I want to do what, uh, what they say in the Cambridge program as interrogate the source. So I'm looking at the source here. Uh, this is, comes from a Cherokee headman by the name of Skyung Gunsta. Uh, I, I assume I'm pronouncing that correctly, and it was written in 1753. So I'm thinking, okay, Cherokee headman, uh, what do I know about Skia Gunska? Uh, Gunsta? Uh, I really don't know all that much about Skia Gunsta, to be quite honest with you. Um, but he, he seems to have been a, an important Cherokee uh, leader. The Cherokee had interacted with the English for a very long time. Uh, they will go on to become one of what was called one of the five civilized tribes. Um, they, uh, the Cherokee had often adopted Engl many of the English customs, many of the English uh, technologies that they, that they incorporated. Um, this was written in 1753, or recorded in 1753. So now I'm knowing, okay, we're talking mid-18th century. Uh, Skia Gunsta had never known a time where Europeans were not in North America. Uh, his father had never known a time when... Uh, uh, you know, Europeans had not been in North America. His grandfather had never known a time when he, they didn't have to deal with uh, Europeans. We have to understand that during this time, Native American cultures and European cultures were pretty well in, under a constant state of interaction in one way or another. North America was no longer a purely Native American culture uh, and never was going to be. Nobody had understood a time before. They had only heard stories about it. Um, the Europeans, of course, were interacting with Native Americans as well. And, um, and these cultures were, to various degrees, had, uh, were of various degrees of power and influence. Um, Native Americans were an active, active part of North American culture as a whole. They were in, they were in a constant state of interaction. And in many cases, Native Americans had taken on um, and incorporated European customs, European technologies, um, and uh, European ways, and of course, in some cases, especially in the uh, in the more of the backcountry uh, areas of the uh, of of the colonies, uh, many of the colonists had also done the same. They had adopted and incorporated uh, Native American uh, ways and Native American cultures. So here, uh, here's um, Sigunsta. He says, "I have always told my people." to be well with the English, for they cannot expect any supply from anywhere else, nor can they live independent of the English. What are we, red people? The clothes we wear, we cannot make ourselves. They are made for us. We use their ammunition with which we kill deer. We cannot make our own guns. They are made for us. Every necessary thing in life, we must have from the white people. Uh, so here's an indication. There's not only just a, a, you know interaction, but there's a sense of interdependence here. Uh, Native Americans are dependent upon trade with Europeans. Uh, they are, they are, um, this is a, this is kind of an, a, a Euro-American culture that is developing uh, in, uh, in North America. Now, granted, it sure looks like I've always told my people, well, he's always had this conversation. So there's probably uh, Cherokee who are saying we really shouldn't interact with Native Ameri uh, with, uh, with Europeans, as much, with a white man, so to speak, as, uh, as we are. And Skia Gunsta is saying, we don't really have a choice. Uh, you know, our lives and our livelihoods and our culture depends on our interactions with these folks.
contrast this to a later period. I mean, this is a painting that comes from uh, the, the uh, I believe, the mid 19th century, um, and it kind of gives you an, an idea of. Um, well, I'm looking at this as a as a document once again, and I'm seeing okay. Well, these are clearly savage uh, Indians. They're about to tomahawk this uh, this innocent white woman. Um, you know, there, there's a sense of brutality here. Uh, these are clear. These are clearly. Um, you know, primitive, a primitive people. Eh, granted, they're they're wearing fabric, which we could argue is a you know a European technology of the time. But for the most part, the image that we see here is a rather romanticized um, and somewhat uh, somewhat insulting uh, version of of, uh, of the Native Americans of this of this particular time period. And yet, we can contrast this with an image that was a little bit more contemporary to the time. Uh, this one, I'm saying again, the first thing I want to know is what's the source. Uh, I'm looking at Hirier, uh Iroquois. Uh, this is a French source, so this would have been folks who were involved with the with the French. I also know that the French typically didn't get along with the Iroquois. Uh, the Iroquois were allied with the Dutch, and then ultimately allied with the English. So I'm thinking, well, maybe this is kind of a stylized version here that uh, the French are probably not going to. Um, paint the Iroquois as being, you know, a, a friendly, happy bunch of people. Uh, so there's probably a, a negative bias that's going to be associated with this image. And sure enough, when I look at the image, that's a pretty negative bias. Um, this gentleman is, uh, is scalping, obviously scalping. Uh, uh, he may, this may be very well, this actually looks like another Native American. Um, but, um, and, and What's interesting is scalping, you know, according to some historians, scalping was a European innovation that was brought uh, into, uh, into North America, was not actually used by Native Americans until Europe, it was introduced by Europeans. But I'm looking at the picture and I'm thinking, wow, look, um, this looks like it, this axe looks like it is, uh, let me see if I can, if I can do the, the thing here. Uh, I think there's a little special thing. If you take a look, oh, whoa, 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 no, 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 that's not what I want to do. Here, I want to do this. Uh, if you take a look at this axe over here, uh, this axe uh, appears to be a, a metal axe. So of course, this would have been a European uh, innovation. Uh, we can look over here. This this is a powder horn. This is good. This is used for storing gunpowder, which of course is convenient because, as you can see here, uh, he has a rifle. Another European innovation. So this is a very Europeanized um, Native American. If we see it, we can definitely see that there there are clearly some traditional uh, Native American aspects to this, but we're also combining that with these uh, with these European influences as well. So, if Native Americans were as incorporated with um, as incorporated with uh, with Europeans as I say, where's the source of conflict? Where are they conflicting from? Well. In many cases, this was a matter of um, preserving their culture. Native Americans were watching their, uh, their populations dwindle from disease. Uh, European uh, um, populations were increasing with fertility and moving into Native American lands, losing territories, um, and also European influ cultural influences such as guns and things that were changing the, uh, the European way of life, uh, the Native American way of life. Um, were, were significant. So, this, so the conflict may have come, uh, one of the causes of conflict is, is just a natural in a, in tendency to want to preserve our culture. Uh, and also to the point of literal self-defense. In some cases, Europeans uh, were moving in aggressively to Native American uh, uh, tribes, uh, tribal lands, and they were going to respond fighting for their particular territory. We also see Native Americans getting involved in this kind of stuff because uh, they were involved in alliances with rival European groups. So uh, the Iroquois that had allied with the Dutch or, and, uh, and later the English uh, oftentimes ended up leading their, uh, their own people into war with the Algonquin that had, and the Huron that had allied themselves with the French. Uh, so they got caught up in European conflicts. And um, also uh, we see retaliation. The, uh, the European style of warfare was much more brutal than traditional Native, Native American forms of warfare. Uh, so in many cases, Native Americans reta retaliated, responded very aggressively to that. Um, but 
Meanwhile, we, we just have to understand, of course, that Native Americans were not passive victims of this, of this time period. They resisted, uh, and they adapted and assimilated in many ways. Um, so uh, Native, Native Americans had incorporated uh, guns, not just guns, but horses. They had incorporated, well, alcohol uh, had become a very destructive influence on Native Americans. Um, and, um, and Native Americans would engage themselves in politics with Europeans, oftentimes on a fairly equal basis, uh, such as that which happened to the Powhatan Confederacy and the famous story of Pocahontas, who did not really marry John Smith, actually ended up marrying a guy by the name of John Rolfe, um, and didn't marry for love, married actually out because uh, to, in order to, uh, to form an alliance, uh, to, to end a conflict. And, uh, and this was not an uncommon way for even Europeans to seal alliances by marrying uh, our daughters to our sons and saying, okay, well, now we're one family, so we can't fight with each other anymore. Um, so we're, we're talking about a very sophisticated interaction between Europeans and, um, and Native Americans. The first real conflict that I really want to uh, talk about here is, of course, the Pequot War. The Pequot War is one of uh, America's bloodier wars. This was a case in which... Um, the English, and with an, in an alliance with the Narragansett and the Mohegan Indians, had decided that they, they, they needed to take out the Pequots. Um, the Pequots um, had actually had had a great deal of power. They they lived along uh, in what southern New England in uh, Connecticut, uh, that area there, and uh, the Pequots had a virtual mon uh, a virtual monopoly on the production of something called wampum. Wampum was their currency. It was their money. These were ribbons of uh, strung uh, shells that they used as a medium of exchange and a store of value like we use money. Uh, and they were the ones that made it. It was their, their deal. So they had to be taken out. The English wanted the money. The Narragansett wanted, wanted to uh, neutralize some of that Pequot power. So they went to war with the Pequots. Uh, and this was actually a very, very bloody year. Um, one of the more bloody episodes of this moment was what we call the Mrs. Stook Massacre, and this is a uh, this is a uh, a quote from William Bradford. Of course, this is a primary source. He was there, um, and he's talking about the uh, the Europeans and the Narragansett in, uh, surrounded this city of Mississauga, uh, which is now Mystic, Connecticut. And he said, uh, and then the English set fire to the village. Um, this really disturbed the Narragansett. They said, "Stop! Stop! Don't do this. This is this is too bloody." Um, and also, in that village were very few warriors. There were mostly women and children. Uh, and this is what happened to them, according to William Bradford. Uh, some did escape the flames, but were slain with the sword. Some hewed to pieces, others run through with the rapier. So you get these, these women and children trying to run from the flames, and they're getting chopped down by, the, by uh, English, uh, English blades. Uh, others, uh, so as they were quickly dispatched, and very few escaped, it was a fearful sight to see the Pequot thus frying in the fire, uh, the streams of blood quenching the same, and horrible was the stink and scent thereof. I mean, powerful, powerful, sensual imagery there. Um, but the victory seemed a sweet sacrifice. Oh, well, there's good news, you know. Uh, and they gave the praise thereof to God. Wow. Right? Wow. Uh, this is one of the more atrocious uh, quotes coming from this particular time period. Um, all, all about 14 people out of the 600 that were in the Mississauga village survived, half of whom uh, were put into slavery, uh, the other seven um, met, did manage to escape. After the Mississauga massacre, this is going to be a problem. Now, the, the war isn't going to last very much la past the Mississauga massacre. The Pequot are, are simply going to uh, be forced. To, it, it's just way too violent. Um, the, Mrs. The, uh, the Pequot are going to uh, negotiate terms, and essentially what ends up happening is the Pequot become illegal. Uh, their, uh, their tribe is broken up. Uh, what survivors of the Pequot War were sent to join other tribes. Um, even the, uh, the, the word Pequot became illegal. You couldn't say the word. Um, this, was called the, um, this was called the First Treaty of Hartford. So we see we got Native Americans negotiating peace treaties 
with uh, Europeans and, and oftentimes kind of getting the, uh, the sad end of this. Um, the um, consequences of this particular war, the Pequot are done. They will disappear for the most part. And um, uh, the Europeans or the English do gain that territory. Um, but even among the Allies, the Narragansett and the Mohegans, they, they remembered the bloody uh, combat techniques used by the English, and they were very unsettled by this. Many of them went back to their tribes and said, hey, look, these guys are really, really brutal. And there was a long uh, period of uh, kind of an animosity and antagonism, even among English allies. Many English allies, and many of the English, to, uh, many of the allies to the English uh, felt very weary of doing business with the English after this. The Beaver Wars. Now, the Beaver Wars were one of the most destructive wars in American history when you take into account the size of the population at that time. And uh, it was a, a very long-term war, over about 60 years. The war is going to start um, with the Dutch and the Iroquois trying to take control of the uh, beaver trade from the French uh, who had allied with the, uh, the Algonquin. Um, ultimately, the, uh, when the, uh, the Dutch are going to be you know, driven out by the English, ultimately, uh, the English will take up this, this banner. The Iroquois will ally themselves with the English, and they will fight their long-term nemesis, nemesis, I guess, I don't know, uh, the Algonquin, the Huron. And... Um, and they will fight, um, fight for a while. Now the, um, the, um, uh, where am I going here? Um, uh, uh, I'm losing my train of thought. Uh, the Algonquin at this time were, um, they had become very, very weak from disease. They had been struck by smallpox, uh, whereas the Iroquois had kind of gotten, uh, they were still being hurt by it, but not nearly as much. Uh, the Iroquois saw this as an opportunity to establish its power base around the, uh, the Great Lakes, and of course the English saw this as an opportunity to move in on this uh, very lucrative beaver trade. Um, ultimately, uh, it will work. In fact, uh, the Huron tribe will be wiped out. The Susquehannock tribe will be, uh, will be wiped out. Um, and ultimately, the Algonquin will be forced to sign what becomes the, uh, the, what, the Grand Pai, uh, or the Grand Pai de Montreal, uh, a treaty in which um, the Iroquois established themselves as the power around that region, um, and also said, you know what, we got to be careful when we're dealing with these uh, English and French. We're going to make ourselves neutral uh, under these conditions. And... Um, and that would be the end of the Beaver Wars. But these, these wars, this was a very, very, very bloody moment in time. So, uh, moving along here. Finally, I want to talk about King Philip's War. Uh, King Philip's War is going to last about a year. Um, again, another extremely bloody uh, moment in American history. And this was a period of time there was a... Um, uh, the the person we know as uh, as King Philip here, his uh, his Indian name was was um, uh, Metacom. And Metacom had an interesting history. He had been uh, he had been educated by the English. Uh, he actually kind of liked the English. He was uh, he was a friend of uh, of the English for the most part, and felt that the uh, that that his tribe should do business with the English. Um, so uh, he was part of the, uh, the Poconocket tribe. And, and I mean, if you take a look at him here, uh, we're seeing some, some definite European influences here. The rifle, uh, the shoes. Um, so we're, we're not talking about the, you know, the noble savage kind of, kind of guy. Um, however, as Medicom was, uh, was, was involved in his tribe, taking a leadership role in his tribe, he noticed that the English were further and further pushing against the Poca, uh, I, the, 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 uh, the, the Poconocket, uh, tribe's lands, um, and he decides that he, he has to fight back. He can't just let them do that. And initially, uh, things kind of went his way in the beginning of the, of the war. Um, there were many, uh, Poca, Poconocket, um, uh, victories, uh, however, in a battle known as the Great Swamp Fight, um, Metacom will be defeated. Um, the Iroquois, allies of the English, will turn on him, uh, and ultimately he will be uh, surrounded. 
he will surrender, uh, he will be executed, his head will be chopped off, and uh, paraded through the streets of the town on a pike. Nice. Um, and um, this is going to be one of the most destructive wars in U.S. history. Uh, we're talking about um, uh, over 6,000 deaths when you include uh, European and uh, Native peoples. Um, 2,000 of them uh, were, were, uh, were English. And, um, and a couple consequences are going to come out of this. Of course, the, um, the, um, the English are going to secure their, their possessions. But um, another very important thing that's going to come out of this war, of course, we're looking at 1676. Uh, this is a period in time which the Iroquois are going to form an alliance with the English called the Covenant Chain. Uh, the Covenant Chain is an alliance between the, uh, the Iroquois and the English. And, you know, for fear of, uh, of confusing you, if we go back a frame and we talk about the Beaver Wars, during this time the Beaver Wars were still going on. Uh, so this Covenant Chain is going to be a valuable asset to the English and ultimately to the Iroquois um, as the Beaver Wars continue on for another 15 years. Um, so these wars are in many ways uh, interconnected. Anyway, uh, this is just a brief um, you know, survey of some of the more major conflicts. And these were huge conflicts. Um, during this time, it was understood, uh, English uh, colonists in the New World understood that, um, that they were not safe from Native Americans, that Native Americans didn't just take these, uh, these massacres lying down. They would, when they had the opportunity, they did uh, attack uh, um, European villages. They did uh, massacre European colonists. Uh, and again, oftentimes in retaliation, but, you know, uh, some, of these, some of these retaliations uh, were equally, if not more brutal, than the uh, European uh, attacks against them. Um, and the Europeans had to understand that they were part of and they were negotiating within uh, certain power dynamics that existed in, in the New World at that time. The Iroquois were a power. They were a regional power at this time. They, were, they had geopolitical influence. And they used that influence to expand their power. Iroquois power at this time is going to expand. And usually when we think about this particular uh, period in time, the uh, late 17th century, the early 18th century, we think of this as a time of uh, universal Native American decline. But that wasn't the case for the Iroquois. The Iroquois increased in power. Um, so this is going to play an important role as we move into the next theme uh, in which we start talking about the, the, uh, the American Revolution and the conflicts that are going to take place between the uh, American colonists and the British and the role that is going to be played by Native Americans in that conflict. Um, thank you. Hope you got something out of it. And I'll see you later.